I'm Mike. I do digital cinema for a theater. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, we're going to be talking about digital cinema technology and security. Many of us have sat in theaters. Who likes movies? And have you ever wondered what's up in the booth? I will speak closer to the mic. Do you, uh, has anybody ever wondered what's in the booth? What's going on up there? I remember being a kid looking up, wondering what was going on. Up until recently, we've been doing film. 35 millimeter film is the standard. Um, there is some 70 millimeter stuff. You can still see uh, things in IMAX. Um, image has an upgraded much over the time. Uh, mostly come up from black and white to color. That's about it. Sound has gotten better over the years. Uh, went from analog to digital. Um, here we are with film. A little bit of the uh, Mach 5, Mach 6. Couldn't tell the difference in the movie. They were moving too fast. Um, on the sides here, you can actually see some of what else is going on in the booth. Uh, up here, these dots and dashes are DTS time code, which sync you up with six-track uh, CDs. Uh, so if you're watching a movie in DTS, that's where you're getting your sound from. There's the analog soundtrack. Uh, tough as nails, about like an audio cassette. Um, it's our absolute fallback position. Uh, on the sides is Sony SDDS. It's almost a dead format now, although they're still releasing things in it. And then there's Dolby, uh, Spectral Recording Digital or Dolby Digital Sound. Um, in between the sprockets on one side, and if you look closer up in the left-hand corner, you can actually see the Dolby Double Ds uh, imprinted there. It's a 174 by 174 array that uh, uh, has the sound information uh, for that frame. Problem with film is, has anybody ever been in a scratched movie before? Did it suck? Yeah. Okay. Film can be damaged. It's heavy, um, 70 pounds on average for one two-hour movie. Uh, kind of sucks. And the security measures for getting a printout, you know, a big Batman or, or something like that that's coming out, they're going to give you a code name for the content. It won't come, you know, and it won't say Batman on the thing. Uh, Spider-Man, when it came out, came out as Iguana. I don't know, man, you, I'd miss that one. Um, they do separate shipments. They would ship half the movie in one can through DHL and the other half of the can, or the other can, other half of the movie through uh, UPS, uh, just to keep it separate. And they might put locks on the cans. How worried are we about that one? <laughs> Enter DLP technology. Uh, actually built in 1987, so it's been a long time coming, uh, bringing digital to our screens. Um, first major release was in 2005, and this is the chip that does it. I'm holding it up here in my hand, which uh, you probably can't see too well. Uh, we'll give you some uh, size reference here in just one moment. This is 2048 pixels across and 1080 pixels high for a grand total of 2,211,840 mirrors in an array that is that size. That's pretty small. How tiny are the mirrors on the thing? Um, the gap between the mirrors is one micron this is actually a needle in front of it. Uh, you can't use a regular microscope. This is a scanning electron microscope that's viewed this. We go a little bit closer. Uh, can anybody tell me what that thing is on the center there? Salt. One grain of salt will cover a 12 by 12 array or 144 mirrors. And then we get even closer here. Uh, and you can actually see some of the difference between which way they're tilted. 
Um, a human hair, plug it off your head, set it down on top of the uh, thing, uh, end down, other end up. Would cover this many. A four by four array of mirrors. So we're talking very, very tiny. And the mirrors themselves uh, will shift either to an on or off position. Uh, it's a 12 degree movement. Uh, in this uh, picture here, we've got a light source bouncing the light off the mirrors and going to what we call a light dump. It's basically just a heat sink uh, when you're not putting things out through the lens. Uh, we move two of the mirrors, though, 12 degrees toward, and we're actually coming out the lens, creating two uh, pixels on the screen. And we can add the third. Makes it fairly easy. Um, the DMD chip here, uh, each of the uh, uh, moving segments, if you keep it off most of the time, you're actually going to make a darker gray pixel. If you turn it on more of the time, you're going to get a light all the way up to a white pixel. Each one of these mirrors, remember it's 2.21 million mirrors, can move individually up to 5,000 times each second. And because there is no weight involved, because they're so very tiny, you can do it millions and millions and millions of times, and it won't make any difference. Uh, the uh, stuck pixel uh, problem is very, very, very rare. Uh, so it's a pretty robust uh, technology. This is what it actually looks like inside a projector. Uh, we've got uh, light coming up, uh, what we call the light pipe. It's a mirror that aims it up into a prism. Uh, the prism is six elements, uh, dichroic, and can split off the red and send it over to the red DMD, the green, send it off to the green DMD, and the blue off to the blue. Then it bounces the light out to the uh, light dump off of each of those, or recombines the image and puts it together to make a color image. So if we wanted a purple pixel on the screen, the green would turn off and the red and the blue would turn on and then depending on what shade of purple we wanted, the mirrors would flutter to give you that color. Um, the colors themselves, uh, we have a high degree of control over what's going on. And so on the CIE color chart, we can actually tighten it down to within one or two thousandths of a point on the CIE color chart. So that when Michael Bay is in there doing transformers and he has Optimus Prime being, you know, these few colors, that's exactly what you're going to see in digital cinema. It's very cool technology. Um, the red DMD is positioned uh, right above things. The green DMD is around the back. And the blue DMD is down on the bottom. And that's the lens facing toward us. A couple of digital cinema projectors uh, that use the DLP standard. On the far left is a Barco. Uh, bottom right is an NEC. And the top right is a Christie. These are the only licensed digital cinema projectors uh, using the three-chip DLP system. There is one other digital uh, cinema standard out there. It's called Sony SXRD. Um, it's a completely different technology. It's liquid crystal on silicon. I don't have any of these, so I don't know too terrible much about them. The one thing that's cool is you got standard definition, uh, what you would look at there, DCI 2K is digital cinema through DLP chip, and the 4K digital cinema is what that Sony SXRD projector can output. So it's a, a much higher resolution image. The problem is, you know, DLP, you're running off of these little mirrors, and, you know, there's only so much heat it can take, but it can take quite a bit. Unfortunately, the Sony SXRD cannot take a lot of light, so you're reduced to a sub 45 foot wide screen. So you've got fantastic resolution, itty bitty screen. It's cool, I just don't think it's there yet. Uh, digital cinema distribution. 
We talked about the cans before. There are multiple methods of delivery in digital cinema. You can send me a hard drive. Uh, 300 and 500 gig drives are what we normally get, uh, SATA drives. Uh, we can do a network transfer. You can actually send it over the internet if you want. Uh, satellite delivery is kind of brand new. We've received a few movies that way, and it's actually quite cool. Uh, we're using spare bandwidth on the birds, uh, so it's actually quite cheap for us. Uh, but it is a, an effective way to transfer. Um, no locks, no sub subterfuge required. Uh, the content is encrypted. Uh, we're going to talk about that in just a second. Uh, just a little bit about the content itself. A DVD, 4.7 gig. Blu-ray disc, 5, 50 gig. Uh, average D-Cinema uh, movie is about 150 gig. We have some as low as 60. Uh, the largest one we ever had was The Last Pirates of the Caribbean, and that was 320 gigabytes for the entire movie. This is how it works, uh, security. Uh, the content is stored in a RAID array and is sent to what we call a media block, or you could read it as a decoder. Um, these could be in the same box. They could be down the booth from each other uh, or two boxes sitting right next to each other. Uh, the media block decodes the video and audio portion of the uh, content and sends the audio up to the audio processor. Digital Cinema Standard is 16 channels of uncompressed audio. Uh, if you watch a show in film, you're probably about at a 96 to 128K uh, uh, KBPS uh, MP3 file. It's about the compression level. Um, this is completely uncompressed, so you go to a digital cinema it's going to sound bigger, faster, and stronger. Um, we're not using all 16 channels. Uh, 7.1 is the standard for most things, and that's all in the first eight channels. Then there's uh, hearing impaired uh, for inside the theater and descriptive video service uh, for the blind. The uh, video is sent out on two uh, dual-link HDSDI, high-definition serial digital interface cables. Um, you got 10 bits of color uh, information on the first cable and just two bits of color on the second cable. Uh, so the color space is exactly equal. There are four bits for uh, red, four bits for green, and four bits for blue. Uh, when, it's, when the content is leaving the media block, it is actually re-encrypted with something called Cinelink 2 and sent over those wires. And the decryption key for that is sent along the Ethernet cable going to the projector. So you can't just plug it into something that could record HDSDI dual link. Um, and then there's a separate layer of uh, uh, encryption that's running underneath that. Uh, that we're talking about here. So in digital cinema, in the media block, to play a piece of content, you've got to have a SHA-1-256 key correctly addressed and unlockable. Uh, the correct date range, we're given a KDM, it's an XML file, uh, that gives us a specific range. We're going to show a slide on that in just a moment. It's got to be the correct content. I've gotten keys for a film, I've gotten the, the movie itself, and they don't work together. Well, interestingly enough, they sent me the keys for the French version of the film, and I'm in the U.S. It doesn't work. Uh, there's also no tampering detected uh, in the uh, media block itself. Uh, these things are locked down very, very tightly. Uh, FIPS 2 Level 3 uh, security. And it uh, basically all of the decoding happens on the one system that I'm very familiar with uh, in the center of a board that has 14 layers, uh, seven on the top, seven on the bottom, anti-tampering material. If any of those layers are breached, it'll shut down the machine and wipe the uh, uh, private key in the system. So there's no way that you can get at it there. Uh, in the projector itself, talked about that underlying security there. There is a second SHA-1-256 key 
that lives on that machine that has to agree. Um, a secure connection to the media block, no man in the middle uh, attacks or anything like that being detected, and no open access panels. They actually have it fairly well locked down so you, you can't get to the parts of the machine that do the actual decoding when the thing is in operation. Um, it's pretty tough uh, stuff. When the uh, security breach is detected, uh, it will delete its uh, Centilink keys uh, and jump you to static on the screen. So if you see that in a theater, you know that's what happened. And sometimes that's a network error of some kind. Um, the Centilink keys, when they're transferred, uh, are good for four hours, uh, but they recycle in two. So theoretically, you're never going to run out of a Centilink 2 key. KDM, or Key Delivery Message, this is the XML file that is transferred uh, to the theater. So if I've got 10 screens in a complex and they're all digital cinema, I'm going to get 10 of these files. If we look here down at the bottom, what just turned blue, uh, content keys not available before 2008, 808, at uh, 6 o'clock, and that's UTC time. Um, I just generated this one to make it look like it was, you know, DEF CON. Uh, and it will not play past 8.10 at 10 p.m. on the uh, on UTC. Uh, there is no way past this. They put uh, very, very expensive clock chips in the machines. Uh, in the system that I know very well, you can make a five-minute time change every two weeks. So there's no way to just rev your date back and play the content all you want. Uh, what's turning red now, uh, the composition playlist, this is actually talking about the uh, individual content that we're going to play. Um, it's got a universally unique identifier. That's a URN, UUID, D12, blah, blah, blah. So each film is generated and given one of those. And then the content title text, I've named this one uh, DEF CON. It is a feature film. Uh, it's presented in scope, which is the wide aspect format ratio. Uh, it's in English with no subtitles. It was generated in the US. It is NC-17, because we all know it is. Uh, 5.1 sound after that. So that could be 7.1 uh, or 2.0 if it was uh, uh, stereo only. Uh, 2K Digital Cinema, if you remember uh, back that it's uh, 2,048 mirrors across, we call that 2K Digital Cinema. Uh, so that could be 4K if it was in a Sony house. Uh, the title of the studio that generated it and the date that the uh, content was generated and who generated it, which was me. Um, above that, I'm not going to change the color on it, but uh, you have X509 subject name. That's actually addressing the media block uh, that's inside the uh, uh, machine. And uh, so you see that there's the hash, the TRXE7, and then some information about the player itself. In this case, we're talking about a Dolby DSP100, um, Dolby Show player. Uh, there are a couple other security measures in digital cinema. Uh, mostly to help them search for pirates. Forensic marking, uh, DCFM is a distribution channel forensic marking. Uh, how many of you like Transformers? This was Ratchet. He was at the uh, uh, Show West convention. Um, if Ratchet is sitting there in a static shot, they will actually take and put an image on that in this case, the 681, this isn't a, a real world example. They can put a 681, and they can identify and track that back to a specific distribution of the film. So this is one method that they use to help find where a movie came from. The other one is a uh, forensic marking, uh, playout marker. Uh, how many of you like Batman? It's good stuff, huh? This was at Show West also. I have several pictures of this, and it was just awesome. Um, they've got you looking at the bat pod. But over on the side, 
they've actually put some dots which may or may not show up too well on this screen and that's actually giving them information as to date and time that it was played. They have several of these running in different sections of the movie and so by adding them together, so say that somebody recorded with a video camera in the theater, they can actually piece this together and there are a few other uh, methods. There's some audio watermarking as well. Uh, so the last film that I heard that was uh, pirated straight out of a US based theater, they knew within two hours what time, what location, and what was played and I assume that they uh, would subpoena credit card records at that point and try and be able to get the information or watch security footage to be able to try and find the person who's actually... We'll take questions in just a little while. Um, so it's very, very locked down. Uh, is it bulletproof? That content isn't going anywhere. Um, but really with the, the pair of SHA-1-256 keys, uh, a few other things. I mean, how many of you here have a uh, machine that can take dual link HDSDI? It's, it's, it's very difficult from the exhibitor standpoint or someone who has physical access to the hard drive to actually use it to pirate the film or whatever. The other problem is, is that because all of the security is happening inside the box, you never know when one of those playout markers or DCFMs is going to happen. So you don't know what sections you're going to have to blank out if you're talking about stealing a film. Uh, so hopefully the studios will find you. That, that's, that's their hope. 3D technology is getting big, though. Has anybody seen a digital cinema 3D movie? Okay, we've got a few here. How many of you have just seen 3D movies any time in the past, you know, 20 years? Okay. Did you like it? 3D was a gimmick. It really was. And it's come back and it's gone away and it's come back and it's gone away. Um, in the previous iterations of 3D anaglyph technology, how many of you have worn glasses like this? Okay. Two main issues. Okay. So here's this image that's up on screen. And because film is a mechanical process, it's shaking a little bit. Up, down, left, right, as it's going through. It's not much, but it's noticeable. And it gives you a headache. It drives me batty. Um, the other problem is that filmmakers want things to eat your head. They really do. You know, I mean, every 10 seconds, you know, there's something trying to eat my head. It's a pain, and you end up with a headache. Am I right? Okay. So, how digital cinema fixes this problem. In digital cinema, the spec is that you can have one quarter of a pixel's shake and be okay. So you think about how very small a pixel is, one quarter of a pixel shake. It's really not noticeable, especially when you're a little ways back from the screen, which hopefully you are. Um, so we, we fixed the, the shaking problem. The other thing that filmmakers have realized is, yes, it's 3D. Yes, we occasionally want something to come out and eat our heads. That's cool. But you don't need to do it every 10 seconds. So what they do is they put, like in this image here, they're going to have a plane in front of the screen that things will come out to normally, and it's not very far, and they're going to have some depth to the screen. So it's more like you're looking into a box with a whole lot of immersive stuff going on. It's a much better way of doing things. Um, there are a couple of different uh, companies that make 3D technology. Uh, we're going to talk about each of them. I'm only going to spend a brief moment on active glasses. Um, this is when you have 
a 3D image projected on the screen. There is an infrared transmitter at the front of the theater that is telling your little battery-powered glasses when to shut this eye and when to shut this eye. I don't like active glasses technology, mostly because I think that if I'm watching a 3D film and the frickin' batteries run out, I'm gonna have to get up, walk down the aisle, go down and find the dude and say, batteries, I'm missing the movie. And they're gonna go, oh yeah, I think we got some around here, yeah, okay. It's no fun. Uh, so I am not a fan of active glasses uh, technology. Um, and they don't even really make them rechargeable. Uh, you're supposed to spend like 70 bucks per pair of glasses and it'll last you through about 60 views and then you throw them away. So it's not very uh, cost effective, anything like that. Uh, so I am not a fan of active glasses. Uh, circular polarization though is cool. How many of you have polarized sunglasses? Okay. And if you're looking at an LCD display, you know, and you look at it like this and you probably can't see it, you turn your head this way and you can. That's straight across polarization. Uh, digital cinema uses circular polarization in most of its uh, designs uh, for the 3D. So what we're actually doing is the left eye is circularly polarizing in a counterclockwise direction and the right eye is circularly polarizing in a clockwise direction. This way, if you're bored with a section of the film and you go like this, it's not going to futz the 3D for you. Um, don't ask me how circular polarization works. I've been trying to figure it out for a really long time, and uh, nobody can explain it to me. It's just one of the principles of light and how it works. Um, unfortunately, uh, a lot of people aren't going to spend $200,000 for a projector or for a pair of projectors. Uh, most of my digital cinema projectors are about $100,000 a piece and uh, I don't want to buy two of them and sit them one over top the other uh, to do this. So there's a company called Real D that has come up with what's called a Z-Screen. And this is a, uh, a widget that polarizes left for the left eye and then snaps quickly to polarizing right for the right eye. Here's an image of it here. I hope you can see it. Um, so it's just something that sits in front of the lens and uh, uh, does the polarization very, very quickly. Uh, it's probably a good moment to say that uh, most film, and if you go to a regular 2D digital cinema or you go to a, uh, a film show, you are watching it at 24 frames per second. Regular TV is 29.97 frames per second. And it looks just great to you. Unfortunately, 3D starts to get a little bit jumpy uh, when you're snapping back and forth uh, doing polarization. So we actually ramp this up to three times the frame rate, um, which is pretty darn cool, I think. So you got way much more uh, information being passed through the uh, system uh, just to make you a, a really good 3D image. Um, Real D, first major uh, 3D uh, commercial digital cinema out there, and they have the lion's share of the market right now. So if you go see a 3D film, I know many of you probably went to Hannah Montana, Maybe not. Wrong crowd. Um, this is probably how you saw it. Uh, these glasses are plastic, and that's why they're disposable. Uh, they do not cost much money to make. Dolby 3D is brand new on the block. Um, they're using a technology called Wavelength Multiplex. It's licensed from a company called Infotech, and it was originally designed for and by the engineers at Daimler Chrysler to help them 3D model parts and cars so that their engineers could see what was actually going on and kind of walk around a vehicle. Um, pretty cool technology. 
Um, these glasses, uh, they're using a uh, uh, electroplated material on the glass lenses, so we're out of plastic now. And uh, it's 50 layers of material uh, on the glasses uh, themselves. It's uh, uh, a very intensive process to get this right, and thus the uh, glasses are reusable and not disposable. Uh, we will collect them from you at the end and uh, wash and sanitize them and use them in the next show. Um, the way this works, uh, jump here, standard projection. If you're watching a 2D film, you've got the full range of red, green, and blue color uh, running over top uh, or running out of the lens. It's interpreted by your eye and you make an image. Dolby adds a 3D filter, which is essentially the complete opposite of both of these lenses, and is fractioning out the color information. We've got the left eye and the right eye here. You can see the dotted lines behind is the uh, uh, regular 2D spectrum. And so what we're doing is, is we're fractioning out half of the uh, color information into each eye. Once that's gone through the lens, bounces off the screen, is essentially, you know, refiltered, unfiltered, defiltered uh, by your glasses and is presented to you exactly how it's supposed to be. The nice thing about this technology is, is that it's working with the way your brain interprets color as opposed to uh, circular polarization, which is using a principle of light. You are going to get way less headaches with Dolby 3D. Um, it's the most expensive technology that's out there uh, because the glasses, it's an initial outlay of several thousand dollars to get enough glasses to fill a theater. Um, but it's pretty cool. Uh, because Also because we have such high uh, control out, out of the color space, we can retime the color being projected by the projector for the left lens to compensate for the fact that the filter wheel's in it and that the eyeglass has this color filter and do the same for the right eye so Optimus Prime still looks like the exact same colors of Optimus Prime that Michael Bay saw. It's very, very cool technology. Now the question, which is better? Everybody's brain works a little bit differently. So some people like RealD better. Some people like Dolby 3D better. I'm a Dolby fan and helped play along with the engineering that helped make this work. So I'm actually going to say I'm a fan of Dolby 3D. But here's my reasoning why. In front of the RealD, uh, or in front of the lens, is the RealD Z screen. It is actually physically changing an image. It's an actual image being projected by that lamp, and I don't think that you are not going to lose a little bit of fidelity with that. Dolby 3D, since it's back inside the projector, just forward of the uh, lamp and right behind the DLP engine, which is where all the magic happens, that by just changing light, you're really affecting the outcome of the image. So I think that Dolby 3D is a much better solution, and I, for one, I, I used to get headaches. I go to a Dolby 3D show, I'm perfectly fine. What's coming in 3D? James Cameron, one of the leaders of the uh, 3D spearhead, uh, is coming out with a movie called Avatar, uh, coming in 2009. This is a rumor, but it's a pretty good one. How many of you would like to see Transformers 2 in 3D? Some interest. Probably have to see a 3D film first to make sure. The Hobbit reports that uh, Peter Jackson is filming with uh, 3D cameras. 
well, not Peter Jackson, sorry. I think Lord of the Rings, and I just think Peter Jackson. Um, Parts 1 and 2, releasing in 2011 and 2012. They're also going to do the conversion, it sounds like, and re-release the Lord of the Rings in 2013, 14, and 15. So we'll have five years of Lord of the Ring goodness. RoboCop 3D. They're actually going to repurpose this one. They're going to take it and re-engineer it and make it go, and you can go see that fine film in 3D. How about Ghost in the Shell? Anybody interested in that? Ghost in the Shell 3D. Come on. Be awesome. How about Star Wars? Anybody interested in uh, giving George or Lucas some more money? I have seen test clips from episodes 2, 3, and 4. It's awesome. I don't normally pay for movies because I can just walk into them. I'd pay to see this stuff. Uh, Episode 4 was probably the coolest. Uh, The two test clips were the uh, initial uh, credit roll uh, floating in front of your face, and you're just like, oh, that's cool. Then it gets into the battle in that corridor, and the laser blasts are headed past your head, and you're like, okay, I'm behind this. And then they cut over, and they had the uh, Millennium Falcon taking off from uh, Moss Eisley. Kind of goes up and hovers there for a second and goes off, and you're just like, oh, I'm there. And then the clip ends, and you're like, let's watch it again. Uh, the episode three clip that I saw was the initial battle uh, at the very front of the movie, and that just looks stellar in 3D. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, uh, no, no release date yet. Uh, George Lucas is sitting there waiting for some magical number of 3D installations before he sends this out. Um, Nobody knows what that magical number is. Uh, So we just added two screens, uh, 3D, within the last couple months. And it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger because there is so much more content coming down the pipe. Uh, I didn't list them here, but out of the next uh, nine or ten Disney films, eight of them are going to be in digital or in 3D. So... With the filmmakers and producers getting behind it, it's getting to be much, much better. Um, We've also got uh, uh, Alice in Wonderland, uh, Tim Burton doing that one uh, in uh, stop motion animation, and we'll be in 3D. Most of the places, uh, if they've got 3D, uh, for the last four or five years, uh, Disney re-releases uh, Nightmare Before Christmas. If you haven't seen that in 3D, it's awesome. I think it's absolutely cool. Um, so check online, and you'll see that a lot of people are coming out with 3D content, and it's really going to be a lot of fun. It's a much more immersive experience, and and I just find it rather enjoyable. Um, so here's the question. Where are the best 3D presentations found? You kind of have to do your research on this because uh, I can't tell you in you know Omaha, Nebraska, where to go or anything like that. Um, find out uh, what 3D system they're using or ask around. Um, Dolby, I know, puts up a list of where all of their theaters are on their website. Uh, every theater installed with Dolby 3D. So you can head that way. Um, and, and try out a couple of, you know, Real D and Dolby 3D, and figure out what what works best for you. Um, either way, you're probably going to have some fun. Um, there is also alternative content coming. I know you guys are excited. Metropolitan Opera. Yeah, we're playing that every once in a while. Charge like 15 bucks, and you come see the opera. There you go. Have fun. No. Uh, We're also doing uh, sports events. Uh, The Dallas Mavericks uh, have actually shown some of their uh, games in uh, other theaters, or in theaters in the area in 3D. 
I think that's actually cool. I think the idea of getting together with a few friends and going to see the game, uh, Super Bowl or something like that, just sit in a theater, it's there in 3D, you get to enjoy it. Um, I think that's a great deal. The only thing that's really kind of hampering this is, of course, marketing and legal contracts and that kind of thing. U2 3D, did anybody go see U2 3D? Not many? Okay. Did you have fun? Okay. Concerts, I like in digital cinema or in 3D, preferably 3D. The idea of bending an arm and a leg to go into a movie theater and watch a concert may seem a little bit strange until you're realizing that you're spending 34 arms and like 17 legs to go actually see the person in concert that you want to see, and you probably have a bum seat anyway. Um, this is going to get bigger over time. Uh, U2 3D was kind of the test balloon for it, and there was a whole lot of people who just absolutely loved it. Uh, so I think those are going to be coming more and more, if you're in any way interested. Some places let you play Halo 3 on their screens. At my theater, just Friday night, uh, we took over... I think it was eight screens, and you could split it you know, into the four-person view, or if you wanted to pay a little bit more money, you could have the screen to yourself in a theater, 5.1 sound, 1080p, <laughs> one quarter of the screen for one hour is about $20. It's not great, it's okay, but we have a lot of equipment that we actually have to set up. We have done it all the way up to, I've got one complex that has 12 theaters. We have taken over the entire complex, all 12 screens, people network together playing games against each other. Big sound, you know, the bass thumping, it's awesome. And it really is a lot of fun. So check local listings for that. Um, I'm about done. We got about, you know, seven, eight minutes. Question. So when they record uh, a movie, do they have to do anything special for the 3D? So you're saying, or is it specific to the type of 3D that they're using? Uh, the question is, do they have to do anything special with 3D, or is it, you know, is real D one thing and is Dolby 3D another thing? Great question. Uh, the content is either filmed with a stereoscopic lens, so there are two lenses recording simultaneously, and then it's just put together by a computer. The Dolby system can take that natively. To use Real-D, you're actually going to have to do a process called ghost busting, and it make some changes and gives you some z-axis information that that system uses to produce its image. Um, but no, you can take really any 3D source and make it work. The other thing that you can do, like in the case of Star Wars, you know, episode four, he wasn't filming with a stereoscopic camera. That's actually an engineer uh, or an editor going in and creating the z-axis information and putting that all together so that you can have, you know, Han Solo sitting here and, you know, Chewie right next to him and Luke behind him, and it looks cool. Get you? Anyone else? IMAX is a completely different deal, and as far as I know, there's no digital aspect to that. There is what's called a DTAC that's running the audio uh, for the uh, IMAX, and if they've threaded slightly wrong, it does take a while for it to catch up and do it right. Um, I don't know too much about the IMAX standard, so I can't help you more than that. 
Uh, but that's probably what happened. It, it's not a digital uh, picture. It is digital audio, though. How does it work if you're in the center of the room? Great. If you're in the side of the room, maybe not quite as great, but it's very, very good. The interesting thing is, is that the uh, uh, Real-D glasses are completely flat lenses. Um, Dolby, because they were doing it, trying to do a much better job, they use glass lenses, and these are actually curved. So no matter where you're sitting in the theater, it still looks accurate to what you're seeing. So... Theoretically, you could. Oh, sorry. Could you do this on an LCD TV, the Dolby uh, uh, color shifting or having the color information? Theoretically, you could. Uh, just to make this work in a digital cinema world um, is thousands of dollars worth of glass. Um, I don't want to give out the actual cost of the thing, but... It's very cost prohibitive, and you'd have to have a digital cinema thing or set up anyway to be able to play it back. Uh, SMPTE, one of the standards boards, did actually just announce that they're putting together a task force to work on a 3D technology for home use. Uh, but it was just announced a few days ago. And so it's going to be at least a year or two coming, I would think. All this is assuming that you're in a theater that's got the digital PLP screen, but what percentage of them are? What percentage of screens are actually digital now or moving to digital? It's ramping up higher and higher and higher. Um, a lot of people are realizing that they have more control over what they play, where they play it, and all that. Uh, so the exhibitors are really starting to jump on board. Uh, out of my screens in my theater complex, uh, I'm at about 87% digital now. Uh, so our, the lion's share of our fleet is already there, and it's just going to keep going. Uh, the, the rest of the nation, it kind of depends on the area you're in. If you're in a large metropolitan city, you're going to get 3D and you're going to get digital cinema. Uh, I know that Regal is uh, very, very into it. Uh, Carmike is doing quite a bit as well. Uh, the, the big dogs are leading the pack. Some of the smaller uh, groups are having a harder time because, I mean, the projector is $100,000 by itself. So it, it takes a little while to build up that capital and make the jump. Are we worried about denial of service attacks um, and someone, you know, with the short time in the keys, you know, breaking something? Not really. All of the projectors that I have have no direct connection to the Internet whatsoever. They're connected to a satellite feed, which most people can't get access to. Uh, or interpolate enough that they'd be able to figure out what to do with it. Um, or if you're, or most of the content still right now is being sent on a hard drive, and I'm just bringing that physically into my trusted area and loading it up to a RAID array. A certificate, those can, are actually either available via satellite, email, they come on thumb drives that come with the content or ship separately from the content. So th there are multiple ways to get it done. And because those keys actually have to go to that one and only machine, if I've got 10 screens, I've got 10 keys coming. Uh, it's fairly well bulletproof. I mean, I can't reverse engineer it, and I've been playing with it for a lot of years now. Got another minute or two? Right over there. 
How are the keys distribu distributed? Email, satellite, thumb drive? Uh, usually not. What we do is, is like if I got a film print and I wanted to play it in a big house, I could. If it wasn't doing that well in sales, I could move it down to a small house and move something up. So they'll actually send me a key for every one of my screens to play a piece of content. Um, I could not play there, but it's, it's you know, if I've got 10 screens in a, in a complex, I've got keys for all 10 screens, okay? That's about it. Uh, I'm going to head over to the uh, Q&A room, and we'll also have, if you want to hold DLP chip or play with any of the glasses or ask any questions about cinema, digital cinema, 3D, come on over. Thanks for coming.